Welcome everyone. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Sabine Eckman and I'm the director and chief curator here at the Canberra Art Museum. And uh, tonight it is my pleasure to welcome uh, you to Professor Cohen's lecture that will focus on the South African artist Gerard Sekoto and the reception and interpretation of African modernism uh, in relation to his work and beyond. This lecture is held in conjunction with the exhibition African Modernism in America, which situates various artistic forms of modernism at the intersection of the global Cold War, African decolonization, and the US-American civil rights movement. It traces both African modernism within Africa and within the networks established in the United States. Today, we look forward to learning more about Gerard Sekoto and the global reach of South African art. Joshua Cohen is Associate Professor of Art History at the CUNY, uh, the City College of New York and the CUNY Graduate Center, and is currently a scholar in residence at the Schoen Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. His first book, the Black Art, Renaissance, African Sculpture, and Modernism Across Continents, which you can find in the bookstore, by the way, <laughs> received honorable mention for, uh, for the modern, from the Modernist Studies Association first book prize for a book published in 2020. His current book project, tentatively uh, titled Art of the Opaque, African Modernisms, Decolonization, and the Cold War is a critical study of modernism between Africa and its diasporas in the context of decolonization and the global Cold War. He specializes in 20th century Francophone West Africa, South, uh, Southern Africa, and connections to Europe and the United States. His areas of interest are broader though and include African and global modernisms, discourses of primitivism, racial identity, and renaissance in art history. I don't 100% know what that is, but you might explain this. <laughs> National socialist cultural policies and post-colonial studies. He's also very much interested in critical museum studies. In addition to his monograph, his writing has appeared in the Art Bulletin, African Arts, Journal for Black Studies, Journal for Southern, Southern African Studies, Burlington Magazine, Vazafiri, and Africa is a country, a country. In the fall, and I'm really looking forward to that publication, he co-organized an international conference, Art History, Postcolonialism, and the Global Turn, and he is right now preparing uh, to publish some of the contribution as a journal issue. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Joshua Cohen. I'm just gonna do a microphone switch. It's not that we're gonna Test, test, test. Does that sound better? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna wanna make sure I don't blast your eardrums out. So. How's that? Look good? All right, well, Sabine, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank the Kemper for the invitation to have me here. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for being here. It's for me a great pleasure to see the exhibition, uh, which brings together probably more um, works of African modern art than I've ever seen in one place, um, with the exception perhaps of uh, museums in Africa. So this is uh, especially 
um, important exhibition. I think I'm very happy to have it here. Um, the talk that I'm um, prepared is a sort of work in progress, a chapter from the book I'm working on. So I welcome your comments and feedback. Um, hopefully the conversation will be an interesting one for you and will also help me to refine what I what it's from my ideas and what I'm doing. So. In his painting, The Song of the Pick, the South African-born artist Gerard Sokoto deploys bright colors and distinct patterns to figure an African road gang working under the watchful eye of a white foreman. Painted while Sokoto was living in Eastwood in Pretoria, the song of the pick bears a striking resemblance to a personal recollection by the South African writer Eskia Mpalele. I had many times before in Pretoria seen tan Afrikaners supervise African road gangs. A white man stood with hunched shoulders, hands in the pockets, speaking his instructions with the aid of a trembling index finger. I had taken it for granted that he ought to be there, getting work done and merely pointing a finger. But now when I came upon similar road workers, I was filled with impotent anger. Sokoto's painting is remarkable for transforming what Mpalele describes as impotent anger into a decisive pictorial gesture. The impending arc of the workers swinging picks said to crush the foreman, the foreman across the picture plane. The Song of the Pick, which counts among Sokoto's best known works, points toward some of the essential dynamics in Sokoto's art and in African modernism more broadly. Sokoto, first of all, was also a musician. He sang and played South African jazz and Negro spirituals um, on the guitar and piano. The Song of the Pick duly invites us to consider connections between music, representation, and collective action. Although we can't see the workers' faces, we can imagine them singing in unison to coordinate their cadence and ease their labor. At another level, picks and paint carry tunes of their own, whether in the regular thudding of tools hitting the ground, or in the rhythmic pulsations of color and contour that boldly structure the canvas. In the painting, as our historian John Pepper reads it, and this is a quote, the workmen's bodies are arranged in a line like piano keys and the patchwork colors of their shirts and pants hint at a syncopated beat transposed into hues, unquote. For Pepper and for Sokoto, an analogy between painting and music extends to the material and expressive tools of each art. While the piano could be conceived as a blank canvas on which the music is played or composed, the canvas in this case is animated by the principles, feelings, and sense of camaraderie that derive from music. And if the metaphor of piano keys with its, uh, with its cliched yet somewhat inevitable association with racial harmony perhaps does not seem wholly appropriate to the 1940s context of South Africa, then generalized notes and rhythms might correspond just as well to the painting's figures and colors. Or the painting's road gang could be envisioned not as the piano keys, but as its action mechanism by which hammers strike strings the way workers pick st strike soil. The salient observation in any case has something to do with the cross-media and cross-genre dimensions of Sokoto's art. The Song of the Pick developed from an initial watercolor study, and both the oil painting and watercolor may have been based on a photograph, a uh, black and white photograph, taken by Andrew Goldie documenting a road gang in Durban. This particular photograph belonged to Sokoto, and though we have no way of knowing when he acquired it, the photograph may have um, informed both early versions of the Song of the Pick in which the artist made the significant choice to reposition the foreman, who in the photograph had stood behind the workers in a position of secure surveillance, as well as um, a later version uh, of the drawing in the same vein where the foreman's position behind the workers is closer to the photograph's composition. 
We could say more about Sokoto's uses of photography, but for now it bears noting that Sokoto's quote-unquote high art, um, paintings produced for exhibition in galleries, fitting with art histories, a standard definition of African modernism, was devoted primarily to the lives of working class people, especially black people, and drew on popular cultural forms, music, and photography to get closer to them. The Song of the Pick aids us in this way to expand the criteria we typically use to conceptualize African modernism. In this expanded view, African modernism can be understood as a 20th century phenomenon guided by artistic and political concerns that are often inextricably linked, while medium and genre distinctions often um, become blurred or dissolve completely, partly because the urge to compartmentalize various art forms was never so strong in Africa as it still tends to be in the West. What historically constituted African modernism was an array of creative and discursive practices that tended to put the fine photographic literary performance and other arts in conversation, while at the same time depolarizing high and low spheres of cultural production. None of this was confined either to the domain of art, nor was it taking place in a political vacuum. The cross-media, cross-genre features of African modernism served artists broader ambitions during a post-war period marked by decolonization meaning historically complex and sometimes illusory set of political and cultural processes. The outcomes of decolonization struggles were complicated by the inauguration in 1947 of the Cold War, a global geopolitical environment governed by East-West imperial rivalries that turned Africa into a contested arena for communist versus capitalist battles of a cultural and political influence. Through this lecture, I aim to reveal how Gerard Sokoto's life, career, and art were as indelibly shaped by liberation struggles as by the tensions of the Cold War. We will see how the artist's overall trajectory from South Africa in the 1930s and 40s to life in exile in France after 1947 testify to the international dimensions, personal and political challenges, and temporal disjunctions that define his place in history and the broader contours of African modernism. To return once more to the Song of the Pick, it is impossible to ignore how the painting visualizes liberation by anticipating a single moment of impact when white, white rule definitively ends. The picture in this way steers us toward time as a crucial yet unruly dimension of this phenomenon we are calling African modernism. On the one hand, African modernism is historically bound up with decolonization, and you cannot be properly studied but separately from it. On the other hand, neither modernism nor decolonization follow the neat temporal progression envisioned by Sokoto in his painting, and neither actually culminated with such finality. To blend rhythm and harmony in his composition, Sokoto synchronizes the work with bodies and picks. The resultant image is powerfully decisive, as we have noted, but it cannot be taken to straightforwardly represent liberation since it bears no resemblance to decolonization's disjointed timeline, whose plainest illustration is in the wildly staggered dates of independence across the continent. In 1960, 17 new independent African countries were born, while Portugal's African territories in Bissau, Angola, and Mozambique remained colonies and soon entered into wars of liberation that would drag on as proxy conflicts fueled by Cold War antagonisms until 1975. South Africa, meanwhile, uh, remained starkly out of sync with the rest of the continent, thanks partly to its firm ties to the US as an anti-communist stronghold. Apartheid launched in 1948, and the Sharpeville massacre marred the year 1960, inaugurating the apartheid regime's most repressive period. What got lined up in South Africa in 1960, then um, logically the liberation moment anticipated in Song of the Pick, were not triumphant workers, but the coffins of African protesters murdered by police, 
as seen in this photograph by Peter Mogubane. Apartheid would not end until 1994, the year after Sokoto's death. African modernism's temporality was no less disjointed. Sokoto's two friends from 1941, a work lightly developed from a sketch made on the street depicting two young black women strolling arm in arm, troubles Western art history's dominant narrative of modernism because it is painted like the Song of the Pick in an unmistakably post-impressionist style which originated in Europe in the late 19th century. Art historian Keith Moxie in his book, Visual Time from 2014, has lucidly outlined how art historical convention would relegate this work to what he calls the dustbin of history, given the belatedness of its production three decades after the term post-impressionism was coined, and at least five decades after the high point of creative output designated by that ism, um, epitomized in the work of artists like Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh, among others. Moxie cites Oakley and Wiseau's groundbreaking exhibition, The Short Century, from 2001, which inclu uh, included Sokoto's two friends, as a project that has enabled us to think differently about questions of time in modern art, and it illustrates how, um, in Moxie's words, the triumphal progression from one avant-garde movement to another simply does not translate into these circumstances, end quote, by which Moxie means that European modernist temporalities do not apply to Africa. In fact, Sokoto's work resurfaces in Mazur's project in a temporal position that is not just different from, but in diametric opposition to, its presumed location in Western modernist art history. Sokoto's painting in the short century comes to be understood not as belated, but on the contrary, as avant-garde, according to an influential periodization bracketed by a nearly 50-year period from 1945 to 1994. In Nwizor's timeline, African modernism emerges in anti-colonial upheavals following World War II, peaks in the post-independence decades of the 60s and 70s, and graduates the contemporary period following, following apartheid. Catalog essays by Nwizor and his collaborators are explicit about not wanting uh, or wanting to avoid, not entirely wanting to engage uh, earlier colonial era manifestations of African modernism um, and do not have much to say about Sokoto's engagement with post-impressionism or other European modernist styles. While the seminal contributions by Moxie and Inwizor and company are valuable in many ways and rightly problematize narrowly Eurocentric conceptions of modernism, they end up drawing nearly the same conclusion when it comes to Sokoto. Relationships between European and African modernisms are framed as primarily oppositional and ultimately incompatible. One simply does not translate into the other, in Moxie's words. European and African modernisms appear here not even as distinct languages, but as hailing from disparate worlds set to different kinds of clocks. Given this view of multiple antithetical and incompatible modernisms, it becomes somewhat inconvenient, but perhaps all the more important, to carefully consider Sokoto's active engagement with late 19th century European painting. In Johannesburg in the early 1940s, Sokoto then began regularly studying reproductions of Impressionist and post-Impressionist art, as documented by Sokoto's biographer, N. Chabani Mangan. The post-impressionist whom Sokoto most admired was Van Gogh, a fact that shows up consistently in both archival and published texts related to Sokoto and his close friend and fellow South African painter Ernest Mankoba. As South African scholars Elsa Miles and Leslie Spiro have both briefly observed, Van Gogh appears most visibly in Sokoto's art in the still life portrait Mind Boy from 1946 uh, 47. A sheet of blank paper, several books, a candle, and a box of matches are painted in bold colors without overly precise detail on a solitary chair. Sokoto's still life arrangement appears in a faint natural light whose source may be an open door or window to the right rear of the painter and the 
The conceit of constructing a portrait from personal trifles on a chair comes from uh, Van Gogh, who made a pair of still life on chair portraits of himself and of Gauguin during and after the period when the two were collaborating on what Van Gogh named uh, the Studio of the South in Au, France in 1888. Sokoto's title, meanwhile, references Peter Abraham's eponymous 1946 black protest novel placed prominently on top of a larger black book on the right side of the chair. The novel's central themes and main character, Zuma, a young African living in Johannesburg and laboring in the mines outside the city, are all in keeping with the working class spirit of Sokoto's art. The literary citation further instantiates Sokoto's strategy of traversing mediums and genres paralleling the connections to music and photography we observe in the song of the pick. Sukoto's particular choice of still life objects, candle and books, indicate a deliberate selection of Gauguin's chair as the model for this work, or a model for this work. Surely painted with awareness of Van Gogh's own extensive uses of literature, Sokoto's Mind Boy can perhaps be read as a three-way portrait of Abraham's, uh, the novel's protagonist, Zuma, and Sokoto himself in celebration of the collaborative and intertextual nature of artistic practice. <coughs> the dual presence of Van Gogh and Abraham's and Sokoto's paintings suggests a further resonance between the tortured life of the European modernist and the farther ranging phenomenon of racially driven state sanctioned torture in South Africa. At the same time, it could reflect an openness to humanist values, education, and moments of quiet contemplation from which black South Africans were systematically excluded long before apartheid finally began. In any case, Abraham's novel, uh, novel's scathing indictment of the South African mining industry in South Africa's state-imposed constraints on black labor and township life prompt us to be attentive to embedded political significations in the still life. Sokoto's dialogue with European modernism made some white South Africans uneasy, and even some who were ostensibly his allies. The art critic David Lewis, for instance, a friend of Sokoto's, wrote in 1946 that Soldier on Leave an earlier work by Sokoto depicting a scene of carousal in Shabin, Cape Town, belonged to the artist's, quote, more mature paintings, owing to its instinctive rhythm and careful arrangement of planes, unquote, while asserting that Sokoto's current paintings, again, this was in 1946, presented, quote, the tragedy of decline of the artist lifted from his surroundings to foreign influences, which he endeavors to imitate without assimilating them and less understanding them, unquote. For Lewis, the basic elements of Sokoto's paintings three years ago were predominantly Bantu. A Negro element of flat design in cubes, squares, and triangles, and plain surfaces of pure color, juxtaposed and pattern. The more mature point to which Sokoto carried this element was seen in Soldier. In an intervening period, the quality of Sokoto's work, according to Lewis, had dramatically slipped, quote, undergoing a gradual change into decline from maturity as the artist, in Lewis's words, succumbed to European art methods, not from weakness so much as divorcement, from his inability to recognize tradition in his own race history and his utter alienation from the ways and lives of his people, from their customs and his heritage. End quote. I have uh, quoted Lewis at length not to attempt to square his statements with visual evidence in Sokoto's paintings, uh, which would surely try our patience as well as our imagination. Um, but my aim is rather to point out how the white South African critic viewed what he called European art methods as an adulterant, with black South African art being prized for its instinctive purity and simple geometry. Lewis's remarks reveal that the idea of incompatibility between African and European modernisms has prevailed for some time, at least in, in, among certain critics. His position seems uh, seemingly accepts Sokoto's use of paint on canvas, but suggests that the African artist should develop an exclusively indigenous toolkit for working in Western media. Uh, 
For a slightly more tempered position, we can look to a speech made on July 22, 1947, by Senator John David Reynolds Jones to inaugurate Sokoto's uh, solar exhibition at the Gainsborough Galleries in Johannesburg. Reynolds Jones, who at this time headed the liberal South African Institute of Race Relations and administered the Bantu Welfare Trust, a fund earmarked for Africans, opened his speech by extending hearty congratulations to himself and his fellow liberals. Quote, it is gratifying to know that there are amongst us Europeans who will not let racial prejudice deter them from opening the doors of opportunity to enable non-Europeans to enter into the heritage of civilization, end quote. The thrust of Reinhold Jones's message, however, comes further along in his speech when he states that the Western media, um, of, uh, and media of easel painting and other media, um, quote, may in the long run prove unsuitable and inadequate for Africans, but it is they and they alone who will know how far these are inadequate, and it is they alone who can make use of both the old and the new culture to express the new African." Unquote. The contradictory uh, nature of these statements is clear. Reinhold Jones sees Western civilization as a gateway to African advancement, even while the expressive tools of that civilization are flagged for their likely incompatibility with African cultures. To read between the lines here, Reinhold Jones's charge of inadequacy may be directed more towards Africans than Western art and media. In late 1946, Sokoto had written to Reinhold Jones uh, and his organization to ask if the Bantu Welfare Trust would consider funding him to study art in Europe as it had done for his friend Ernest Nkoba, who left South Africa for Paris in 1938. Sokoto's correspondence with the trust continued for nearly a year, but the organization ended up offering Sokoto only 25 pounds to help finance his trip. As it turned out, though, the sales of his painting soaring, Sokoto did not require much assistance. He purchased his passport for 50 pounds and paid his way to Paris via London, sailing from Cape Town on September 27, 1947. He never returned to South Africa. Sokoto's migration to Paris allowed him to distance himself geographically from apartheid, which began the following year. But it did not end up freeing him from the harsh judgments and double binds frequently imposed by white critics, or from the challenges of the international art world, or from other difficulties that went with living far from home. What Sokoto had imagined would be a year of study abroad turned into a tumultuous life in exile. After spending a few weeks in London in the fall of 1947, he arrived in Paris not knowing a word of French. Although he took some classes at the Grand Chaumière Art Academy, he was able to make a living more by playing music in nightclubs than by selling art. These circumstances led him to face recurring bouts of frustration, alcoholism, and depression. In 1949, an emotional breakdown sent Sakoto to the saint Anne Psychiatric Hospital, where he would spend a total of two months, and where his art practice would be limited to charcoal sketches of fellow patients. During his first, first weeks at saint Anne, um, Sokoto's dealer, as the artist later remembered, quote, came along with the journalist from Time magazine who came to interview me and brought out an important article in the magazine with a reproduction of my self-portrait, unquote. Indeed, the American magazine Time, on its issue of August 8, 1949, running a cover story profiling FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, included a short article called Touring Africans. The article reproduced Sokoto's self-portrait and it referred to a major touring exhibition of South African art then on view at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. It was the Union of South African Government that organized this exhibition um, as part, in their words, as part of the Union's contribution to artistic exchange with the outside world, um, and that was uh, stated in an early publicity document. The exhibition's tour had begun at the Tate Gallery in London in the fall of 48, where the Queen and the Princess Margaret came to see it. 
In July of 1949, with apartheid policies in South Africa coming into view internationally, the National Gallery in Washington issued its own press release for the South African exhibition it would host in August. Sukoto stands out conspicuous, conspicuously as the only artist mentioned twice in the gallery's short press release, where most of the exhibition's artists receive no mention at all. The press release describes Sukoto as a Bantu native African self-taught, now studying in Paris, expressing, uh, quote, the simple dignity and urban life of his people, unquote. Sukoto, as uh, reported in time, was, quote, the no only Negro artist included, uh, in quote, among 53 artists in the show. The Time article reproduced only one work of art, Sokoto's self-portrait, and it devoted more than half of its content to Sokoto's story, outlining the artist's early career, his move to Paris, and his recent breakdown in institutionalization. In 1949, with strong U.S. ties to South Africa's apartheid regime, hinting at the disingenuousness of American calls for African decolonization, a striking feature of the Time article is a disproportionate attention to Prince Sokoto. We may go so far as to read this as signaling a new paradigm of hyper-visible hyper contemporaneity, reinforced here in the very title of the magazine, to supplant an earlier paradigm of violent erasure through relegation to the past. No longer the figure of the timeless primitive produced by colonial ideology, the African painter could now appear in a newsworthy uh, human interest story where the Western archetype of the tragic artist uh, most readily associated with Van Gogh is superimposed on the personal image of the contemporary African artist. To facilitate this recontextualization, the Time reporter says nothing about South Africa's relatively new apartheid regime on a mission that cannot have been accidental. Time's editorial choices in this way modeled rhetorical strategies, selective reporting, and diversion through emphasis on the remarkable individual thus crowding out more bluntly authoritarian tactics involving censorship and propaganda within a Cold War atmosphere where state messaging was designed never to be recognizable as such. Sokoto's profile in time and his wider trajectory from South Africa to France both reflect and shed light on the international histories of African modernism in the mid-century. There are good reasons why scholars have largely studied African modernist movements on a country-by-country -country basis as products and symbols of self-determination in newly independent African nation states. Um, and that might be a good topic of conversation later, the, the nationalist dimension of African modernism. And however, the exhibition on view here, African Modernism in America, points to another important dimension of African modernism, an international dimension manifesting partly around Western patronage of African painters and sculptors in an age of anti-colonial agitation in the early decades of the Cold War. As the exhibition and its catalog document, the New York-based Harmon Foundation, which had supported African-American artists during the Harlem Renaissance, turned its attention toward Africa starting in 1947, the Cold War's year zero, beginning in correspondence with the Nigerian artist Akino Walashika, who learned in a letter from the foundation that it sought to develop, quote, a worthwhile beginning in intercultural exchange flow, end quote. Many African artists, including Lashika, Sokoto, and numerous others, derived their own advantages from collaborating with the Harmon Foundation, which acquired hundreds of works and produced major exhibitions and publications over the next 20 years. Yet the foundation's consistent framing of its activities with keywords like exchange, freedom, and cultural understanding, and so on, echoed U.S. foreign policy talking points and reverberated in the rhetoric of the myriad other Western state and private organizations that funded African modern art in the 1950s and 60s, including the U.S. Department of State, the CIA, the Belgian Government Information Center, the British Information Service, MoMA, Carnegie Corporation, Phelps Stokes Fund, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Congress for Cultural Freedom, the American Congress for Cultural Freedom, and the American Society for African Culture, among others. These government and private organizations stated publicly that they were doing one thing, while their Cold War era motivations were quite another, 
stunning as they did from the East-West imperial rivalries that made Africa a contested continent in battles for cultural and political dominance, not to mention various violent conflicts that betrayed the word cold in the Cold War. Such disjunctions between stated ambitions and unspoken motivations reveal an opaque quality in Western patronage of African modern art. Because deplorable domestic race relations in the US could be flagged internationally as undermining the country's self-professed reputation for freedom and democracy, elements of both African-American and African culture at staged in certain ways in venues in the US and abroad could ostensibly serve as advertisements for American pluralistic values. The Harmon Foundation's first major survey exhibition of African modern art, organized in New York in 1961-62, including four works by Sokoto, was entitled Art from Africa of Our Time. In this title alone, and in the titles of the Harmon Foundation's two major publications from 1960 and 66, stressing the contemporaneity of African art, it is clear that the Foundation's project had something to do with synchronizing the African and Euro-North American artistic fields through the notion of, share, of a shared historical moment, our time, understood as contemporary time. The Foundation's framing certainly worked against the grain of what scholar Johannes Fabian has memorably, memorably called the denial of coevalness, designating a Western colonialist tendency to banish the cultures of foreign peoples, especially so-called tribal, primitive, uh, or traditional cultures to a time that's past. With a subsequent Harmon Foundation exhibition carrying a similar title, African Artists of Our Time went up in Philadelphia in October of 66, and again featured works by Sokoto. Our Time emerges as a key conceptual device employed by the Foundation one that, for our purposes, still holds a certain potential to ease those rigid boundaries and still sometimes confine African and European modernisms to wholly different incompatible spheres and temporalities. Nevertheless, in retrospect, the synchronization effort implied in our time cannot help but seem a bit forced, given the Cold War climate and political stakes surrounding Western support for African modern artists. Viewed with an ounce of suspicion, the phrase our time reads as ambiguous. Did the phrase uh, denote a truly shared progressive moment of African independence, or rather a Western temporal orientation into which Africans could be slotted even while Western powers sought behind the scenes to manage the timing and outcomes of African decolonization? First warning against so-called premature independence for African colonies, and then undermining the sovereignty of new African states in various ways. As it happened, multiple internationalisms and temporalities commingled in the African independence era. Connections with other African and diaspora artists and intellectuals buoyed Sikoto's early years in Paris, notably through his participation in the community surrounding the journal and publishing house Présence Africaine. Présence Africaine organized the first international congress of black writers and artists at the Sorbonne in Paris in September 1956, and a second congress of the same name in Rome in 59. Sokoto attended both congresses, published texts in the proceedings of both events, and designed a poster for the Rome Congress. This activity has recently led art historians Christine Amine and Elizabeth Harney to spotlight the artist's involvement in black internationalism. One important facet of this black internationalism was negative, a literary and philosophical movement that had emerged among Francophone black intellectuals in Paris in the 1930s. In the post-war decades, negritude expanded and coalesced into a prominent, if also contested, set of ideas informing African modernism, both in literature and visual art. Illustrating Sokoto's engagement with negritude, a grainy photograph of the artist in the studio in Paris in 1961 shows some painting from what appears to be a female Guru Bali mask from Ivory Coast. No trace of this mask has turned up in the artist's archive, but the details of the mask seem less significant than the photograph itself, which documents Sakota's mode of working at the stage and his unmistakable gesture towards negritude reverence for canonical African sculpture as a symbol of distinctively black achievement. 
Indeed, the specific sculptural or cultural qualities of the mask were not what captured Sokoto's attention. Sokoto's canvas, pictured in the photograph, features the stylized head of an African woman with downcast eyes and reveals the artist's interest in translating the aura and ideas surrounding the mask. The subject's calm expression and legal disposition imagined as restoring a pre-colonial wholeness in a moment of African independence. In a speech at the Rome Congress in 59, Sokoto had asserted that, quote, we, the black people of the West Indies, America, Africa, Europe, and all parts of the world, must remember that while becoming enriched by rubbing with other cultures, our common search should result in creations deriving directly from African art, end quote. Sokoto's words here owe much to Negritude's rhetoric of returning to indigenous roots to achieve African unity in post-colonial Renaissance. In the poster he designed for the Rome Congress, Sokoto similarly drew inspiration from African statuary to evoke Negritude and a spirit of black solidarity. Sokoto in this way made some of the earliest visual art reflecting Negritude philosophy at a time when Negritude was just beginning to influence modern art movements in Senegal, Nigeria, and elsewhere. Sokoto's Negritude painting arguably attempts to resolve some of the tensions we have registered around African modernism's aesthetic orientation, with indigenous African material culture now decisively favored over European painting as a point of reference. Sokoto, in other words, has exchanged post-impressionism post for African sculpture to establish a clear continuity with pre-colonial indigenous artistic tradition. Having adopted post-impressionist techniques to paint urban life at least in South Africa, the exiled Sokoto comes to align sculptural objects and personal memories to develop a recognizably African iconography. Time and space were thus tangled together in Sokoto's practice. To paint African sculpture while enthralled to negritude was, in certain of unavoidable ways, and despite troubling resonance with colonialist notions of immutable, timeless tradition, to go in search of a glorious history in need of recovering, guided by what some would call negritude's nativist nostalgia. And if the African sculptural object stood in symbolically for the African continent and for Sokoto working in Europe around 1960, studying the mask or statue also meant looking back of his personal past while looking geographically elsewhere toward home. Such an orientation seems fitting to the position of an artist in exile, as well as timely insofar as it belongs to the moment of negative ascendancy. Yet if the exile of Sokoto's visual language was new, some of the dynamics that underpinned it were not entirely so. Negritude's analog and precursor in South Africa was the new African movement. And Sokoto was arguably a new African artist well before we encountered Negritude. New Africanism coalesced in the 30s and 40s among South Africa's black elites. Like Negritude, New Africanism drew inspiration from the New Negro movement in the Harlem Renaissance in the United States. Sokoto was among the country's mission educated Africans, having attended the teachers' training college at Grace Jia, near what was then Petersburg in the northern Transvaal from 1930 to 33, before working as a teacher at Kaiser Secondary School in the same area from 34 to 38, alongside his fellow artist, Ernest Mankoba. In the late 30s at Kaiser, Sokoto and Mankoba regularly visited a nearby Ndebele village where Sokoto made watercolors that anticipated some of the concerns of his later negative paintings. The scholar Mtongala Masalela has written that Sokoto and Mankoba during this period, quote, like other new African artists and intellectuals, were searching for forms that would make representations of the dialectic between tradition and modernity possible, in a particular instance through painting and sculpture, end quote. It is significant that Masalela writes of a dialectic, which we might just as easily think of as a dialectic between African and European modernisms. The fraught relationship that these two modernisms has, as we have seen, consistently worried the minds of scholars and critics looking at Sokoto's art. The common tendency has been to try to resolve this dynamic ten tension, just as Sokoto himself arguably did with his Ndebele paintings near uh, Petersburg and later Negritude paintings in Paris, by privileging the African element. As you recall, liberal South African critics 
Lewis, Lionel Jones, saw European influence as deleterious to African creativity. More recent art historians and curators, Moxie and Muzo and others, rejected Euro, Euro modernist narratives for the exclusionary timelines and values they impose. The conversation has since taken a few more turns, on which I will comment by way of conclusion. In a 2002 article, the artist and curator Olu Yibe coined the term reverse appropriation to describe African modernist adoption of European modernist styles as political acts that carry um, the power to, quote, undermine the ideological foundations of the colonial project and overwrite, as it were, the colonial text, end quote. Okibe commented specifically on Sokoto's Girl with an Orange from 1943 as a painting that cites uh, directly Paul Gauguin. Ogibe, in other words, confronts Sokoto's engagement with uh, post-impressionism and argues that Sokoto, quote, considered modernist expressionism the proper space of contest for modernity in the 1940s, unquote. A seminal, seminal intervention in post-colonial art history Ogibe's essay draws in unacknowledged ways on the work of Honi K. Baba to theorize the agency of African modernists in and despite their colonial context, reading their work in a Western idiom as a strategic choice serving to disrupt colonial authority. Ogibe's essay, in turn, has been cited in recent years by scholars of global modernism um, as modeling a method for adjudicating problems of colonial era creative influence. As welcome as incisive as Okiba's intervention is, it also raises a number of questions. If reverse appropriation is both politically and creatively satisfying, why did African modernists turn so often toward indigenous roots in movements like New Africanism and negritude? Does the theory of reverse appropriation hinge too much on a choice of words in the sense that more historical evidence may be required to determine whether any instance of cultural transfer is best described as having been forced upon its recipient or offered seductively or alternatively taken by force, perhaps indeed appropriated? And are there limitations to thinking about along the lines of a bilateral dialogue between Sokoto and Gauguin, given Sokoto's interaction in the 40s especially during his years in Cape Town, with South African progressive artists associated with what became known as the New Group. Artists such as Maggie Laubser, whose work was shown here, um, whose efforts to appropriate European modernist aesthetics had been in the works for some time when Sorot and Sokoto arrived on the scene and then overlapped with his. Responding to Ogibe's intervention, art historian Lise Van Roebrook has offered a very different account of Sokoto and his generation of New Africans. In articles published in 2008 and 2011, Van Roebrook points to Sokoto's portrait of a young boy reading as evidence of the artist's own educated, elite, upwardly mobile, and thus exceptional status compared with most Africans under white rule. Overall, Van Roebrook herself paints what might be called realist picture of South Africa's black moderns, emphasizing aspects of the worldview that do not line up with our current metrics for radicalism or agency. She emphasizes the modernist generation's faith in a moderate politics of assimilation, belief in enlightenment, humanism, universal values, willingness to collaborate with liber liberals, and perhaps most emphatically on her part, their, quote, profoundly ambivalent blend of pride, nostalgia, and shame, end quote. Van Roebrook, that is, questions the subversive intent imputed to modernists by Ogibe, concluding that the cultural and political project of African modernism ultimately failed, making room for the more radical currents like Pan-Africanism and Black consciousness. As for Sokoto, he struggled hard in the second half of his life against a world that clearly had so little place for him, but frequently rejected his credentials both as an African and as an artist, and gave him no country to comfortably call home. Today, Sokoto's work is at the center of vital debates in 20th century art history around issues of temporality, periodization, relatedness, um, and modernism and postcoloniality, among others. Noting the extent and richness of Sokoto's of, as well as the artist's will to keep moving and making art despite the odds, we may conclude that it was perhaps not Sokoto who was ambivalent but rather the 20th century world with its rigid categories and expectations that was ambivalent about him 
and that eventually wore him down as it would anyone. Meditating on such questions, our historian Chico Keke Bulu has written that modernism's challenge was, quote, less a matter of, of ambivalence than a practice of subjective pragmatism toward the making and articulation of a modern cultural identity, end quote. Well, Keke Bulu's notion of subjective pragmatism seems especially germane for reflecting on the legacies of African modernism. In Okeke's scholarship, subjective pragmatism is perhaps best encapsulated in the ethos of natural synthesis pursued by some independence era Nigerian modernists. Applying it more broadly, we might take subjective pragmatism to mean that modern artists did what they could, using the elements at their disposal at a time when there was no clear path for what they wanted to become. Um, despite the constrained circumstances of colonialism and its after aftermath, and without being overly concerned with the perceived contradictions or obstacles in their way. This, I believe, registers something of the modernist condition. Amid other considerations, one of our challenges in studying Sokoto and others of his generation is to strain and attempt to see the world the way they did. Thank you so much. As I said, I, I welcome your questions and critical engagement and comments and other reflections on you know, this material, including what we've seen in the exhibition. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyway, so I'm not an art historian, but I'm interested in modernism. So I might ask you, probably the wrong way to do this, I should ask this at the end, but your last comment suggests that this idea of subjective practice tells us something about modernism's little agenda. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I just came across that phrase that I was trying to come up with the conclusion that I was searching. Well, no, it's, it's, it's yeah. Chico Keke, a Buddhist phrase. Yeah. Um, and because I was thinking about uh, I mean, these, these various interventions from, from Igibe, from Ms. Van Roebrook, um, which I think are really valuable to have in mind. Um, and subjective pragmatism seemed germane, as I said, because it seems to capture the way that uh, artists simply did what what was what they could with what was available to them at the time. Um, and it's sometimes easy, I think, to read backwards and say, well, it was insufficiently radical, as so often happens in readings of the Harlem Poem Renaissance. I mean, I think we've maybe gone past that time now in the literature of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and maybe the African modernism literature is evolving in the same way. Um, but uh, and, you know, it's not to say that African modernism is, should not be critiqued. I think there are many ways you can critique it. And one of the clear things about, I think, this, this, let, this presentation, surely, and to a lesser extent, the show, as you see, it's disproportionately male. Um, they're very, and it's different in different countries. Um, in some countries, you have more, more women working. Um, over time, certainly, there are more women working. So one of the clear critiques of modernism is that it's masculinist. Um, but there are also historical reasons for that. Uh, but I think, yeah, to, to my mind, that, that phrase was helpful in my, in my thinking about this, just to, to, to try to to try to situate these artists historically. And so the, it could be alongside that kind of the contemporary critique, um, but to try to place them in their, in their moment and think about what all they were up against and trying to do that. So, um, it's pretty, to me, it's, it's remarkable um, that they did, that so many of them did continue to make work and continue to, um, to pursue what they wanted. And it's also, uh, there's also, I think, a tragic element to it, which is a little bit what I'm trying to get at with Sokoto's story. Um, he's not the only, uh, I don't mean, mean to paint him as entirely a tragic figure, but there are some elements that don't quite jive with kind of like um, what I think of as a, a triumphant decolonization narrative. But he, he actually was able to get out 
to, to flee at part time, but his life in Paris didn't end up materializing the way he hoped. And I think it was because uh, Paris was just so closed off. Really. And you know, Mankova was also very much marginalized during his time. So the pragmatism was sort of what they had, but it sometimes didn't, wasn't enough in the face of all, all, the, all the obstacles they faced. Thanks for your question. Well, I mean, I, I don't want, no, I, I, I ended with that phrase, I don't want it to seem like, it was, it's, it's cheap for Kate Baker's so the one who thinks like, oh, yeah, I went to this talk and you talked about you know, subjective pragmatism, uh, or, yeah, and maybe some of them, Chico Kate Baker was like, what, that's fine. Uh, but it's not, it's not either at the center of what his project is, it's just a, it's something that he, he, he said in, in reference to this idea of ambivalence. And I, don't, I think he was kind of maybe indirectly responding to Lise Van Gogh. So I was just kind of trying to tra track the, the con yeah. conversation as it developed over the last 20 years or so. And um, as I've been trying to meditate also on how do I, how am I, kind of what's my intervention. Um, and I think one of my key interventions is, as I was saying, to highlight the illusor illusory and fraught aspects of decolonization, mm -hmm. um, and also to, to highlight the international component, which is also one of the reasons why decolonization is illusory and fraught, because there are so many hands uh, you know, at, at work, um, and the Cold War really redirects a lot of the decolonization struggles in, in various ways, um, including because many uh, anti-colonial activists and organizations were communist oriented, which is not to say that we're necessarily full, full on communists or taking orders from Moscow, but they had that orientation for that reason. And also then anti-communism uh, anti becomes uh, a good pretext for the US and other, its, others of its allies to stamp out radical anti-colonialism uh, and to, and to uh, shape decolonization the way they want it to go. Um, and I think those are elements that are important to register and haven't quite registered enough in art history, even though they do register in other disciplines. Well, that's why I was asking, I was wondering what happens to that, that flexibility as we move into the polarized environment. Yeah. And do they become that? We have said that some of these are very quickly engaged. Yeah. That sort of works against the notion of subjective. Well, they, they have to adapt. Yeah. So, some, so sometimes they might see that if you're too, uh, which I think is also true if we're talking about African American activists, if you're too obviously aligned, or even if you're not even very obviously aligned with communism, that can be used as a pretext. Um, so artists might distance themselves a little bit um, for the sake of, sort of keeping their projects alive. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I didhear the whole question, but I think, yeah, you're right. The, the psychological and political aspects of that Could you talk a little bit more about the nationalization, like nationalism and modernism, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. I'm really curious about that. Um, I think that here, you know, the emphasis on, on Sokoto, I think there's like a way that you, know, you enter into a conversation about South African modernism, right, which is its own, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of literature around that. Mm -hmm. There are other, you know, we're comparing it also, you know, with the ending of Chica, mm -hmm. you know, his emphasis in Nigeria, mm -hmm. the cycle of Nigerian modernism. So how do they then, <laughs> I mean, it's a dialectic, but it's also like within the continent, there's a whole, range of conversations happening that isn't necessarily captured in that duality of like European modernism and African modernism. So can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. And it's a great question. I think um, so there are kind of two things there. One is, you know, does the international perspective then 
then what do we do with the, with the, with the niche? And I think the answer is they're not mutually exclusive. There, there are artists who can navigate the nat a national art scene and an international art scene all at the same time. The national context is extremely important, for one thing, because you have so much uh, patronage, I mean, especially in places like Senegal, where I work, but, but in a lot of places. The funding for the arts, the um, ethos for many artists, especially in the years following the independence, um, was driven by nation building. And so that's not something you want to ignore. And also, talking about pragmatism for, the, for scholars who are going out into the field and you know, doing dissertations and writing books, it makes a lot of sense to concentrate on one country, because it's already a lot. Um, but I think the point that I am interested to pursue, and I, you know, and even in a national, it, whether it's uh, Elizabeth Harney on Senegal, or Chico Gigi or um, uh, Delinda Collier on Angola, there are international trajectories woven into the national story. Uh, and sometimes it has to do with influences, sometimes it has to do with artists traveling. So it's more kind of about the, of the, the larger frame, I guess, for, the, for a project. And you're trying to think of, well, how, how, there are only so many countries in Africa. You know, I can't like go to, we have modern art histories for quite a, quite a few of them now, and multiple for some countries. So are there other frames that are, that are important? I think one of the frames is the um, international is maybe too broad. Um, but one of them would be, for me, is this, a sphere of influence, because that also troubles the colonial, post-colonial kind of divide, kind of as a sharp rupture. Um, so one of my frames is the, Fre the Fre French sphere of influence, which becomes known as the La France Afrique after independence, and is this, for lack of a better term, a neo-colonial environment where um, French French ideas and funding and political influence is still very much present in different countries in different ways after uh, after uh, colonialism. Um, also, to bring in the question of European modernism is not to say that you know all African modernism needs to be understood in relation to Europe. I I don't think so. I think it makes it, where where it particularly makes sense is if the artist himself is quite obviously in dialogue. Um, that, it's, then you have an issue where if, you're, if you don't want to talk about it, then there might be a, a level of kind of like, oh, it's too complicated, uh, it raises some difficult issues, let's, let's just like say yes, go down, or then go and like move on. Um, but I'm kind of interested in, oh yeah, that's, that, is a, that is a troubling thing. Um, and I think ultimately, maybe this is something I didn't end up getting to say is that to, to create a space for, like Agibe is doing, for appropriation, um, if that's what you want to call it, um, for engagement, for um, dialogue maybe, uh, is ultimately another way of acknowledging the agency of, of uh, African artists, that they, that they have, it's the, uh, what's become to be known as the Picasso Monke syndrome. You know, the, uh, Europeans can adapt and borrow from, from non Western or non Westerners, but not vice versa. So to me, this is part of kind of reversing that, that um, trend. It's one of those terms that just is going to stay there forever. Yeah, um, it's really Yeah, and I think there was a, I think it was Michael Baxendall. I'm not familiar with the whole project, but I just know that he wrote in a way about influence and saying that it's not a good term because it, it implies passivity. Um, and I kind of push back against that a little bit to say that yes, perhaps, but 
an influence is also something that an artist goes toward and engages you know, with consciously and with, with purpose and sometimes for, for a very particular reason. Um, so, I mean, I think sometimes, that's what I was saying, sometimes it seems, some of these arguments seem to come down a little bit too much to like the choice of terms, like which term are we using? Because um, if you call it, you know, um, cultural colonialism, as some critics did, uh, Africanist art historians were very skeptical in the 1960s of African moderns. They thought of it as, you know, derivative, and we want to look at the, you know, the traditional art, which is dying, and all we have is now is this modernist stuff that's reflective of European. That, to me, is not the right attitude, because it, it implies exactly this idea that you know, we have to keep, to keep the spheres separate. And, and I understand the impulse, and it's in fact, the, the irony of the complexity is that it's an anti-Eurocentric impulse. And we're, no one's for Eurocentrism, um, but that it does, if it's too rigid, it gets us back in this place of kind of like separate and isolate. And I don't know that that's helpful to me. Black writers and artists. And right, and black writers and mm -hmm. artists. I mean, at the time, I would imagine Picasso did this cover because he was part of the communist movement. And, you know, and so I was just wondering about the role of communism mm -hmm. um, in Paris and much more in his case before the yeah, emigrated. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah, I, I also thought about kind of speculating on the communist sensibility there, but there's no evidence in Sikoto's writings or, and he's, he has written extensive testimonies, there's no evidence that he was actually quite political. Um, definitely not communist. But uh, do work on other artists who at certain points were very much aligned with um, communist circles in, uh, in Europe and in Eastern Europe. Um, and that, to answer the, the question about the pragmatism, at a certain point, to be too, too closely aligned, or only aligned with the communists, becomes a liability, um, especially after the start of the Cold War. And that's where you see some, some shifts occur where artists are. And I think, I mean, there's also, going back to, you know, Césaire's, um, letter to Maurice Torres in 56, different examples of um, African or African descended intellectuals also resisting the, a, kind, a certain kind of communist agenda. Um, that you know, we, may, we may see eye to eye on the problem of colonialism uh, from the perspective of class, but not from the perspective of race. And that ends up being something that leads to rupture with. with uh, Yes. Mm -hmm.
Well, there's no doubt that there were quite a few, uh, I mean, especially going back as early as 1900, before the issue of um, strong anti-communism ended up kind of writing a, you know, writing a death sentence in a certain way for your organization. There are, there are histories, um, really good histories. One of the ones I like is Penny von Eschen's um, Race Against Empire. 1997, it talks all about uh, our, uh, the question of decolonization as an aspect of black, uh, ra radical black politics, but then very concerted you know, efforts to squash those organizations, basically dismantle them. And, uh, so, uh, for example, Du Bois wanted to attend the 1956 conference in Paris, but he couldn't because the US government revoked his passport. So then he sends a message, it's this eerie message that's read by Ali uh, Ibn Jop, who's the organizer, from, from Du Bois, saying any African American who's here is here because they're going to say the type of things that the United States government wants, wants him them to say about race relations. Um, and so that, and that was the um, American Society for African Culture. Those are the people who were, who were there. Yes. Yes. So it seems to me that what Sokoto had access to in terms of reproductions in Johannesburg in the early 40s was primarily post-impressionist or impressionist and post-impressionist. And it's not that because the art scene is very conservative at this time. And it's not so much a question of style, actually. So you have someone like Edward Lower, who was the dean or something of the, uh, the, the art school in Cape Town, Sounding like he was, uh, you know, a Nazi, more or less, in terms of his ideas about about art, degenerate art, during the forties. But he was also a post-impressionist. Um, and then you had more progressive artists, who, many of them who were more Jewish, um, in Cape Town, who were post-impressionist, expressionist to some degree, primitivist in problematic ways. People like Ernest Stern who are painting these kind of portraits of uh, isolated individuals in a timeless, time, timeless way, but you know, clearly very, very referencing German, German expressionists. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's, all, it's all mashed up in ways that kind of make us have to think carefully about the different elements. Yeah. 